Jack Flaherty absolutely dominates, and the Tigers are back to a 500 record. Let's talk about it all today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Friday, May 31st, 2024. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team. Every day, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 with any winning $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. And if you took the over on Jack Flaherty's strikeouts, you probably are having a pretty decent day. Welcome in, everybody. Happy Friday. To all the Detroit Tigers win another ball game, this time by a score of five to nothing against the Boston Red Sox in Boston. Always good to get a win in Fenway. Also, always good to win, get a win to kick off a series. So great on a lot of fronts there. Five to nothing. Jack Flaherty was dominant. We'll talk about that in a second. That is now five wins in the team's last six games. Just uh, what a roller coaster ride they are taking us on this season, right? We lose five straight, then we win five of six, and now we're right back to 500. This team has the potential to be 500 or better heading into June for the first time in, in almost a decade. 28 and 28 record as it stands here, heading into the ball game on Friday night on the 31st. What went right in this game? Well, we're not going to bury the lead here. I'm not going to pull out my my journalist tricks here. And we're just going to talk about the biggest story of this ball game off rip. And that is Jack Flaherty going absolutely bonkers yet again. It's not even like, oh, like this is just clearly, you know, an outlier. And, and he's really, you know, we're hoping that he can maintain it. He's just done this for most of the season. He goes six and two thirds, one hit, no earned runs, one walk, and nine strikeouts. He had 10 swings and misses just from breaking pitches alone in this game. It's not even including the fastball. I think he had seven on the slider and three on the curveball. This was, without a doubt, in my eyes, right from where I stand, sit, whatever. The best that his breaking ball looked, has looked rather, all season. I I thought the slider and the curveball, knuckle curve, I think is what he calls it, were absolutely unhittable in this ball game. And, and like the fastball was great, right? Like he had everything working. He almost had a no hitter, right? Like he was he was obviously fantastic. Uh, the the fastball was really solid, um, but the the reason that the fastball was great in this one was because of the command right the velo like he wasn't pumping 96 97 the velo kind of did that 93 to 94 thing which is still fine for him clearly right and and the the command of it was the reason why it was so good the tunneling that he does specifically in a few situations is so brilliant so the first one i want to bring up is when he faces a lefty, right? He goes righty lefty and he does fastballs up and away, not up and away to like the the corner necessarily up and away, but but above the belt and outside, he tunnels that with then sliders low and away, right? A lot of people take sliders or curveballs whatever, but a, a lot of people, you know, if they have confidence in their slider and it's an opposite handed platoon, you will see them try to hit that back knee, right? That's like such a common phrase. You know, you, you want to throw a slider that looks like a strike and then it dies and then it moves so much that it hits the batter's, you know, back leg. And he he has the ability to do that, I think, but he really lives on the outside. And that, I think, in, in my eyes, is honestly 
better the way that his stuff moves because then he's not risking hanging a slider as often as someone who is trying to hit the back knee, right? Because then, like, um, Brennan White last year did a lot. You know, we talked a lot about him with the Tigers and how, okay, like, his slider moves so much. He has such great spin, but his ERA was high and he got hit really hard, and that's because when the slider went where he wanted it, it was a great swing and miss pitch, but he hung it a ton. And Flaherty, like, okay, he misses – so what? He's missing way outside of the strike zone. He's hanging that pitch two feet outside. And I think that the the sequencing and the tunneling that he has found out or discovered or or been able to just execute just straight up, even if it's not a new thing, this season so far in doing that specifically to lefties is just unbelievably brilliant. Um, and, and he also does a lot of fastballs low and away. We saw that to both handedness. We saw that a lot to lefties. Got a couple of, of called strikes on fastballs low and away. But the, the, the thing that makes him so great is when his fastball is at its best, having no fear of throwing it to either handedness anywhere in the zone. And that is what we saw in this one. You know, I'm highlighting the tunneling of that to lefties because I, I think it's so impressive. But this is a dude that was dotting fastballs low and away to righties. He was dotting fastballs up and away to righties. He threw it up and in to both handedness multiple times as well. We know he loves to go with the fastball on two strike counts, but it's just a matter of where. He was absolutely brilliant. And like I said, I, I this was genuinely the best that I think his, his slider and curveball have ever looked. I was I was floored. I, I was blown away by it. And I'm not even talking about command, just straight up stuff and movement, right? The velocity wasn't any different than it usually is. The spin didn't, I, I don't think was like significantly different than it usually is, but but it was doing something special in this ball game. And and uh yeah, I, I thought the sequencing was brilliant. I thought everything was brilliant. Props to Carson Kelly behind the plate as well. He is now on the season in the 97th percentile in whiff rate, just swings and misses, top 3% in all of baseball. He's 95th percentile in K rate, 33.3% on Thursday in K rate. That is one of every three hitters he struck out this season. That is ridiculous. That's absurd. Top 5% in the league. And then the thing that is really the the biggest reason why he has still found success with the obviously uh, you know the strikeouts is great 94th percentile in walk rate. This is a guy that is getting more strikeouts than almost anybody in baseball while also walking the fewest amount of hitters than almost anybody in baseball. He is living in the strike zone and nobody can do anything about it. I, he has, and you know, the ERA is a little high because he got popped a couple of early starts in the beginning of April. This dude, I don't even care. This dude has legitimately been one of the best starters in the American League so far this season. And and he deserves his flowers. So I, I know we just spent an entire segment talking about starting pitching, but there's a few really like nitty gritty things I wanted to point out. And then obviously talking kind of, kind of big picture, just how fantastic he has been. So Jack Flaherty, unbelievable outing. And without a doubt is if, you know, if you're doing like biggest difference maker in this game, it is certainly him. Okay. Let's keep the ball rolling and talk about the offense that showed up at some point in this game. And then we'll talk stuff, obviously, and preview the weekend at the end of the show. We'll do all of that right after this. Got to talk to you all today about our friends over at FanDuel. It's winner take all time in the NBA and NHL, and FanDuel's giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and so much more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count. FanDuel. America's number one sports book. 
All right, everybody, welcome back here. Segment two of Locked on Tigers. Appreciate you all for tuning in as always, making us your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. And we will be back on Monday recapping games two through four of this four game set against the Bo Sox. Also, be sure to check out Locked on Sports today, the first of its kind 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube talking sports. 24 7 from all of our great hosts here at Locked On. Be sure to check it out and subscribe for free on YouTube or watch it for free in the Amazon Fire TV channels app. The Detroit Tigers win five to nothing over the Boston Red Sox. Spent a lot of time talking about Jack Flaherty. I think rightfully so, obviously, but a lot went right in this ballgame. This was a pretty comfortable and convincing win. For the Detroit Tigers, especially from the fifth inning on. It was 0-0 through the first four. But some home runs were hit in this ballgame. And that's awesome. We don't see too many three home run games from this Detroit Tigers offense. Akil Badu, Gio Urshela, and Riley Green all hit homers in this one. You know, I, I said... I don't remember when, last week, maybe even two weeks ago now, that I, I wouldn't be shocked if Gio Urshela went the whole season without a home run. So naturally, here we are with Gio Urshela hitting a homer. Got a hold of that one, too. Really got the barrel out on the ball. He just throws the the bat at the baseball. Uh, I'm still taking the under on whatever you think Urshela's uh, home run total is the rest of the season over on FanDuel. But... We will gladly take it over the green monster. Really got a hold of that one. Akil Badu, we'll talk about in a second. Please let this be Riley Green making an adjustment to lifting the baseball. Please. Uh, for the love of everything, just start lifting the ball more, big dog. I, I'm I'm begging. I am I, I'm literally begging. Okay, so hopefully that is, like I said, a sign of things to come, but really got a hold of that one. And, and hopefully, again, just up to a 781 OPS. It was down there in the 750s for a little bit. Cause for concern. We've talked about that a lot over the last few weeks. Had a really rough month of May. Let's make June a good one. Eh? Why not? So good to see him get a hold of one. And then Akil Badu, with, uh, he was the first person to score for either team in this ballgame. Opposite field over the green monster. Solo shot in the fifth inning. Uh, you know, we talked about it a little bit. It was that yesterday or two days ago. His mechanics are just so different. And, and it's so fascinating to me. And I'm really hoping that it can be a cause for an uptick in Honestly, like just batting average, right? Like we know that he has the power. We've known that his entire career. That's what, that's the reason why the Tigers have hung on to him this, I mean, just consistently through all the slumps and and kind of the roller coaster ride he's been on over the last couple of years is because he walks and he has a lot of speed and has a lot of power. And those three things you don't see all in one player very often. He is electric. He is uber talented, but he's been hitting like 200, you know, 210, 212. The last couple of seasons, the, the he just hasn't been hitting the ball in play. And he's been striking out a ton. So I'm hoping that these, his betting stance really does kind of look like a lefty Matt Veerling now, which I... <laughs> I mean, Matt Veerling's been Barry Bonds the last week, so if that's a sign of things to come there, obviously. But joking aside, I I think that they are trying to put his hands in a position. A, the weight transfer is different than it was, right? He's way more just kind of all the weight is on his back leg. That kind of toe is pointed. He's on his front tippy toe almost, so the weight transfer is a little different. But also the hands are just in a totally different spot than what we were used to on the start. And, and you know, he wants to go back and then come forward rather and attack rather than just starting back and having that big loopy swing that we're so used to from Badu in his career. So if this can cut down his K rate and he can continue just doing what he's been doing, show off the power every once in a while, draw some walks, be that kind of electrifying player on the base paths. Um, I, I'm hoping that that could lead to a resurgence in his career. Now, I'm not like declaring anything. I'm not saying, oh my goodness, the mechanics changed and he had a home run in one game. So like he's back. Don't worry about it. No, we, I, I want a much bigger sample size to prove that these mechanical changes 
are actually for the better and are actually going to lead to that. But that's what, from where I'm sitting, what they're trying to do. And I'm hoping that uh, that happens, obviously, because when Akil Badu is right, he, he, he <laughs> you, you go back to his rookie year, man, that that's a, that's a, has the potential to be a really valuable player. So we'll keep an eye on that is really the, the long-winded way of saying we'll keep an eye on what he does going forward. Colt Keith in this game, two for four, didn't get pinch hit for when a lefty came into the game and got a base hit off of a lefty. Brought a big old smile to my face. Glad AJ let him hit there. Glad he came through there. Hopefully it's a sign of things to come because this has never been a platoon guy, right? Colt Keith mashes everybody. He doesn't care, right? But Colt Keith's bat that does not care who's on the mound, right? So I'm hoping that, uh, but you know, he got to stuff such a rough start in his major league career. I didn't blame AJ for doing it with Keith, Keith specifically, goodness. Uh, but I, I do hope that this is also a sign of things to come. I've been saying that a lot this episode, but uh, a lot went right in this ball game. Matt Beerling stays hot, gets on base twice, gets the double down the line, hits off the green monster. Torkelson had a, we'll talk about his offense. That's certainly going to be on the side of things that went wrong in this game, unfortunately, but he did have a phenomenal day defensively. Had a couple of really good scoops as well as an unbelievable play to his right, uh, diving, laying out, and uh, at the time, keeping the no-hitter alive, which is really was a really cool moment in the moment. Uh, so I just want to give him his credit, you know, for as much as we've been dogging on him really just all season in all aspects, and especially, you know, I've been really hard on him defensively the last – well, his entire major league career. Um, this isn't like, oh, he's a gold glover now, but that was a really good play. And um, yeah, well, again, want to see it over a big sample size. The bullpen in this outing was great. Alex Fido, Tyler Holton, both of them doing shut out ball in the eighth and not, well, the seventh, eighth and ninth inning between the two of them, only allowing, I think, one base runner, two base runners maybe. Great work. Tyler Holton looked fantastic. Even knowing, like AJ knowing that Boston and Cora was just going to unload all of the righties on his bench in that situation, Holton still staying strong and getting those outs, I think is absolutely wonderful. I think that's everything that went right. A lot. Two thumbs up. Great performance from everybody. What went wrong in this game? I actually want to start off by saying I don't think this specific part of the game went as wrong as maybe people think. So maybe this should be in stuff, but this is how I want to start off this segment, which is is weird and, and unlike me. But we're going to try it. Um, I, I know a lot of people were concerned about how the Tigers looked in the first four innings of this ball game. Nick Pavetta sliced and diced them, had eight straight strikeouts at one point. Obviously, that's not great. I'm not here to argue that that was good. But Nick Pavetta was incredible, right? Just the same way Jack Flaherty was. There's a lot of hitters that are having really good years in that Red Sox lineup. But Jack Flaherty was a man possessed in this game. And like Nick Pavetta for the first four innings was also. Uh, like I I'm really not too mad about what the offense did in the first half of this game. Now, it's a lot easier for me to sit here and say that after still getting a 5 nothing victory, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in stuff. Uh, but I'm happy we even got two off of him. He was His stuff was unbelievable. That's some of the best I've ever seen Nick Pavetta look. That that big loopy curveball was getting people. Um, and, and, and when that thing's on, it's a good pitch. It's just he's been so inconsistent, and, and the walk numbers have been inconsistent. Um, but he was spinning the ball like crazy. Uh, I, I thought he was absolutely fantastic in hitting all of his spots, hitting his spots with his fastball as well. Just got a little bit away from him as the outing went along but uh so like again like a bad stretch for sure like eight straight strikeouts I'm not here to tell you that that was good um but I I'm impressed that the team still fought put up five and sometimes pitchers are just really good so we're, again we'll talk about that a little bit more in uh in stuff let's talk Torkelson all right we'll do that right after this got to talk to y'all today about our friends over at Stitch Fix with Stitch Fix, you can get a stylist who understands your style, size, and budget, and they do all of the shopping for you. It's the easiest way to update your wardrobe 
this season. You can easily upgrade your wardrobe this year with a professional stylist that helps you find new on-trend favorites that will work for you. I just give my stylist my size, my style, and my budget preferences, and I order boxes when I want and how I want for no subscription requirement. And they send five just-for-me pieces plus outfit recommendations and pro styling advice. I keep what works, and I send back what doesn't. That's the coolest part. If you don't love something, you can just send it back. Shipping, returns, and exchanges are always free. So style that makes you feel as good as you look. You can get started today with stitchfix.com slash MLB and get $20 off of your first fix. That's stitchfix.com slash MLB for $20 off. Stitchfix.com slash MLB must redeem within seven days of signing up. All right, everybody, welcome back. Your third and final segment of Locked on Tigers. Appreciate you all for tuning in as always. The Detroit Tigers win five to nothing. Unfortunately, another rough day at the office for Spencer Torkelson. His stats on the season are now a 205 batting average and a 608 OPS. It is brutal to watch at this point. He looks absolutely lost at the plate. Um, He cannot time up a fastball consistently for anything. And it's gotten to the point where now, because he can't time up a fastball for anything, it has made it so he cannot time up any breaking balls or or off speed low and away. You see how he's attacked? It's fastballs up and it's breaking ball and off speeds low and away. Because the only way he's timing up fastballs is by like cheating on them. And I don't mean literally cheating, but like he it's, it's, it's okay. This is a fastball count. I'm going to sit fastball and take a hack here. It's, it's, it's not great, man. And when you can't time up the fastball, it makes it so that you can't time up anything, especially when major league pitching is just peppering you low and away. Those are really, really hard to time up consistently. And that's where we find ourselves. Um, I, I know that a lot of people are still clamoring for him and have for a while for him to get sent down. Uh, I really dug my heels in on that idea because I, I think he he needs to time up major league fastballs. And the velocity difference between major league and triple A pitching has never been greater in the history of our sport. And I, I just... I, I've really dug my heels in on that, but I, look, there's a breaking point for everything, right? I, I'm I'm beginning to turn a corner, and like now he'll inevitably go on a hot streak because, like, of course. But it, it's I, I don't know what else to do, right? I'm not sure, but he he really does not look good in there, and even when he does put the ball in play. It's just all low, like, grounders down the third baseline. And we talked about that last week, too, right? A lot of his balls in play are just low grounders to the third base side or pop-outs to the first base side. You know why? That's because of timing. He's rolling over. Everything he's out in front of, low and away. And he's late on everything that he's getting underneath, which is fastballs up and in. Not great. Really not great. So uh, obviously we'll keep an eye on that. Really unfortunate start to the year for him. Javi, I guess, too, right? Just to be like, be fair. Javi has looked terrible at the plate as well. But like that, it's not even like new. Like that, yes. We, no one expected him to be very good this year. And he's not very good this year. That, that It's not even like news to me. It's not even worth bringing up to me at this point. Yes, we, we have a black hole in our lineup. And he usually hits eighth. It just is what it is. He's really good with runs in scoring position, hilariously. That's pretty much all he brings on the offensive side of the ball. Let's talk stuff. Um, I I mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, this offense is never going, like, was never and is never going to be at the top of the league this season, obviously, right? But this is a game that I can really appreciate. Like, the starter, again, diced you. 
for most of his outing and for all of the first four innings. Um, and, and look, man, like it's a long season and these are all major league pitchers at the end of the day. And, and this is the best that major league pitching has ever been in the history of baseball. And like, sometimes starters are just feeling it. Like sometimes you face great pitchers, like genuinely just, you know, the best pitchers in the sport. Or sometimes you face guys that have four, four and a half ERAs and are just having really good days. That That's unavoidable over the course of a season. So to walk out of this game with five runs, considering how dominant and good Pavetta was, and get to the bullpen after you knock a good starter out of the game. Like everybody but Torkelson and Baez had hits in this game. They they had eight hits, seven unique hitters. Just beautiful adjustments, just credit where credit is due. I, I know I talk a, a lot about this offense and, you know, the hitting coaches and et cetera. And if we're going to bash them when they struggle and they fail to make adjustments in game, I, I also feel very responsible to give credit when they do the opposite and so this was a game that I just really 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 greatly appreciate um, because just because the starters having a great day it doesn't mean it's just impossible to win or put up runs at some point and I think that this was kind of the imperfect the perfect uh, I don't know example of that uh, another thing I, that that might be it for the ball game we'll see but another thing just popped into my head after Flaherty got pulled from this one, was where does Scooble, Flaherty, and Olsen rank in three best starting pitchers in one rotation out of any team in baseball? It's a question. Think about it. Do some, you know, look around. Think about other teams. I'm, I'm wondering. Because since September of last year, Codify tweeted this out. Since September of last year, Scooble and Olsen have literally the two lowest ERAs amongst qualified pitchers, starting pitchers in all of baseball. It's like a one seven five and a and a one five something for Scooble. And then Jack Flaherty has been one of the best strikeout pitchers in the sport, and, and has been dang near unhittable for the last month and month. Yeah, month month and a half. I want to know everyone's opinion. Where, where does where does that three headed monster rank? I think it might be up there. And that's really exciting, right? Really exciting over the course of the season to just look. And it's, it's awesome to know, okay, the offense might come and go. And, and this is what we talked about. This is what Scott Harris said going into the season, right? It, it's nice to know who knows what you're going to get with the offense this on, on any given day. Mostly this season, it hasn't been very great. But yet three pitchers who have been absolutely phenomenal and are absolutely dealing right now. And that's great. Gio Urshela batting cleanup in this game was hilarious, and then he homered, which made it even more hilarious to me. So good for him. I think that's pretty much everything. Oh, just like around the league stuff, David Fletcher is a knuckleball pitcher in AAA. Struck out Jackson Holiday. Didn't have a bad final line. Five innings, two, three earned runs, few what, four or five strikeouts. Okay. For sure. He's got a lot of off-the-field stuff going on, too. He's got to deal with, so it's wild. David Fletcher's lore should be studied in, in history classes for, like, my grandkids' generation. I think that's it. 5 nothing win. Let's preview the weekend really quickly. Uh, again, you are now 500. The Red Sox are now a game under 500. So going into this, I'll let you in on a secret. Going into this, I kind of wrote down that I expected to split this series and I expected to win when Flaherty and Olsen pitched and lose when Maeda and Mize pitched and that's as much to do with who's on the mound for us as it is who's on the mound for the Bo Sox. Um, Tanner Houck has been unbelievable this season, he's going up against Maeda tonight, who obviously has not been unbelievable this season. And then Mize faces Bayo, who I, as I mentioned yesterday, is one of my favorite young pitchers in all of baseball. I think he is the future of the Red Sox rotation, and uh, I, I'm kind of scared to face him 
because I just adore him. Uh, but but and Mize had a couple of poor starts in a row now as well. So I I think just kind of matchup wise, you're you're in a spot where it, it's. I don't know. I think the writing is kind of on the wall. I'm notoriously wrong about this stuff. I'm sure the exact opposite will happen now just because I put it out into the universe. But that's kind of what I was thinking going into it. So now that they've won Flaherty, the you've won the Flaherty start. You have a chance now to take three or four in this series. And that should be, I think, the goal. So, well, obviously, that, that's not really a new statement. Your goal should be to win games. Hard-hitting analysis over here at Locked On Tigers. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. I appreciate you all greatly. We will be back on Monday. All right? Peace and love. Going to Therapy's Dope. I'll catch you all then, baby. Go Tigers.